Come on in and we're going to get started this morning. Come on in. Good to see you this morning. Hope you all have had a great week. I had the opportunity to uh, be at Camp Shatek in Shatek, Wisconsin. So as you know, I, I didn't have any camps scheduled for the summer. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get to spend the whole summer at community. And then the Lord uh, divinely intervened and gave me two opportunities. The one was that I've already, where I already was in Arizona, and that was due to um, bring Gleiser's health. Andy wasn't able to make it very last minute. That was on a, found that out on Sunday night at around five o'clock, and then Monday morning at five o'clock, I was leaving the house to go to Arizona. Okay, that was very short notice. And then uh, this one wasn't quite as bad, but um, there was a little bit of a mix up. So the camp director had scheduled my brother Scott to speak for the summer. Scott spends his summer up there. He runs the teen leadership program called Team. And so he, he was scheduled to speak. That's what Randy did, but, but you see what Randy had forgotten is, is that Scott had already booked a meeting out in Oregon. He was speaking at a camp out in Oregon. And so they get to, uh, they get to uh, staff training week and they realize Scott looks at the brochure and, and sees his face on there and he's not gonna, he's not gonna be there. He's like, uh, Randy, I'm not gonna be here. And Randy was like, um, what am I, yeah, it's, you may not know this, but it's very difficult to find somebody to speak camps last minute. And so he, so he called me up, and he was, I'm not going to say he was begging, but it was pretty close, all right? It was, it was pretty close. And he, he liked the idea. He goes, look, it's just, you know, we got Savinsky and Savinsky, you know, you know it kind of, uh, could you please come? And I was like, you know, I kind of feel like he's getting the better end of the stick. I, I feel like he paid for coach, but got first class. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of how I feel about it. So anyway, anyway, the Lord, it was an unexpected week. And um, so the Lord gave us a great week. We had uh, six children who made professions of faith in Christ. There were numbers of other kids who were dealt with about the gospel. We're super thankful for that, other decisions. And uh, so glad to be home, glad to be back, and excited to be in God's Word this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 is where we're going to find our text this morning. We are going through the book of Titus in our Sunday school this summer. And we've already completed chapter 1, and we're going to get into chapter 2. Just a little bit of a reminder from where we were last week. Titus 1, we were really challenged with sound doctrine, sound teaching. Again, again, that's one of the major themes that you find throughout the book of Titus. And we're going to get into now a really practical section. So Titus, so Paul, in his instruction to Titus, he's kind of moved from the pastoral qualifications, which is a major part of chapter 1. And then this, this, the kind of the last oh, quarter of the chapter, he really goes in depth with the importance of sound teaching and guarding against false doctrine and false teaching and some of the things he needs to combat and to be looking for. And now he, in chapter two, he's really going to give some extremely practical application to the church, living out our faith, living out our relationship with Christ in the context of our local assembly, in the context of our church. And this is going to help us as a church to not only grow in our relationship with Christ, to grow in our relationship with each other, but it's also going to help us to be better equipped to be salt and light and to be a testimony for Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. So Titus chapter 2, our text this morning is going to begin in verse number 1. We'll read verse 1 through 5, which will be our text for the morning. He says this, it says, but as for you... Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So the chapter begins with an exhortation. So he says... Uh, if you look at the beginning of it, he says, but as for you, so he's, he's really doing a contrast here. He's saying, so these, verse 16, speaking of these false teachers, says they profess that they know God, but in the works they deny him, being disobedient and abominable under every good work reprobate. So he's, now he's making a contrast. That's what the little word that's at the very beginning of verse 1 is, where but is a, the Greek is a contrast word. It shows the stark contrast between two things. So he said, instead of you, you're not to teach false doctrine. Instead, in stark contrast to what they're doing, here's what you are to do. And he says, but as for you, he says, teach. The word teach here is in the present imperative. So number one, it means it's a command. 
And the idea that it's in the present tense is the idea that it is to be continual. So he said he is commanding Titus, you are to be continually teaching this truth. This ought to be a continual teaching in the church. By the way, this is really important for us to understand. We need to constantly be reminded of the truth of Scripture. And we as a church body, this was given to us, recorded for us. We need to be reminded of what he is about to say in chapter 2. We need this constantly rehearsed and reviewed and given to us to help us to live lives that are pleasing to Christ and to help the church function according to God's design. So what is he supposed to teach? He says, well... Look back at verse 1, he says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine or healthy teaching. The things that are in line with, that are according to, that are in agreement with, he says, sound or healthy doctrine. And again, that's in contrast to the false teaching that was being given. So here the idea is it's healthy biblical teaching and preaching that's going to produce godly Christian living. It is, we have to understand healthy biblical teaching is the source and foundation of our living that helps us to please Christ. And it's also what God uses to equip us, not only to live for Christ, but also to be a witness to those who don't know Christ as their Savior. So there's no substitute. There's no substitute for healthy teaching and preaching. It's absolutely essential. And I want to remind you of something here. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. He says, uh, for the word of God, Paul writing to Timothy, he said the, that the word of God is profitable for four things. Okay, does anybody know what any of those four are? Okay, I'm, I, know, I know it's Sunday morning. I know it's early. I don't know if you had your coffee or not. Okay, so I don't know if your brain's really working. It's okay if it's not. But there are four stated purposes and benefits that God says his word does. The word of God is profitable for four things, okay? According to 2 Timothy 3.16. Anybody, anybody want to sh- give a shout out? What's one of them? Doctrine. Doctrine, yes. The other one, reproof. Yep. Correction. Correction, one more. Instruction in righteousness, teaching in righteousness, teaching in right living. So he says God's word is beneficial. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, breathed by God. And this, here's why is that important? Because, because God is the source of this word. He is the ultimate authority. The, the reason the word of God carries authority is because it came from the person of God. So he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word is beneficial. It's profitable for doctrine. Same word here, healthy teaching. But that word then reproves us. You and I don't like reproof. Let's just be honest. We don't like it when we get told what we're doing is wrong. The idea of reproof is, is what you're doing is wrong. It needs to stop. It needs to stop now. Okay, right? You, I Believe it or not, I used to get reproved a lot as a child. I know it's probably surprising to some of you, thinking I'd be such a well-behaved young man. I remember it. So just imagine if you would. Can you imagine? My, my poor, my dear, sweet, blessed mother. <laughs> um going to church, you know, 40 churches a, a year, 40 weeks out of the year, going all across the country with her kids, and sp- specifically with her kids, <laughs> my older brother, me, my younger brother, my sister. Jennifer was pretty well behaved. Um, so, was, so was Todd, pretty much. Scott and I, mm. and I can remember this. I can remember being in church, and my dad, praise the Lord, was not a long, not a long preacher, and I, but I can still remember. I can Remember being in church and being a little fidgety, a little hyperactive, whatever. Have you ever been in church and, had, and you have felt the, those, those of you who are like Star Trek or Star Wars people will under, understand the illustration of a tractor beam, you know, that, that pull, that pulling force, you know, that comes on you. Have you ever felt the tractor beam of your mom's gaze? You ever felt that? The power of your mother's eye upon you? And I can still remember, I'd be sitting there in church and all of a sudden I'd be like... And there's my mom. I can't give a mom's eye because I'm not a mom. Okay, I can't do that. But she's given me the she's given me the the look. So this all happens kind of at once. So there's the look. She had this. You know, this was in the '70s, the eight late. You know, the I remember the pike. You know, when I was five, six, seven, mid to late '70s, and she carried a purse that was this big. <laughs> And she, it was a black leather purse, and she always carried a wooden spoon from the kitchen 
about this long, and that's what I got spanked with all the time. And so there's a wooden spoon, and the end of it, she still has this, by the way. She still has this spoon. And it was, it's blackened on the end. It was just burned a little bit. And so I hear this, what all happened. I feel this, this look, and she's not saying a word. And this, all of a sudden, she, her hand being her person from the depths of the purse, like from the murky depths of the ocean, like the dorsal fin of a great white shark breaking the waters, <laughs> this spoon tip would come out of the water, out of the purse, and it all is all at once. She didn't say a word. But she was reproving me. What was she saying? What did the gaze and the spoon all say together? What was the message she was getting, to, getting across? Brent, you better straighten up. And you better straighten up now. Because if you don't, there are going to be consequences. Okay? That's what God's word does to us. God's word reproves us. God's word confronts us when our lives aren't pleasing to him. And the reality is none of us really like it, but it's necessary. And when we understand that it's good for us to be confronted by God's word and it's good for God's word to confront our thinking and to realize sometimes it's not just sinful thinking that's wrong. Sometimes we've elevated even to some of the things that we talked about last Sunday where our traditions have elevated themselves to the same level as truth and we're not thinking biblically about certain things. It's good for us to be confronted about these things. We need, it's good and healthy for us for God's word to reprove us. But not only reprove us but shows us what's wrong Correcting is the idea of showing us what's right. And then the instruction in right living is the idea of it's kind of like a step-by-step. -step. This is how you live in a way that pleases God. We need God's word to instruct us, to teach us, to help us to know how to conduct our lives in a way that is pleasing to Christ. So that's really what he's getting at here when he says, you teach things which accord to sound doctrine. Now what he's going to lay out here beginning in verse number two, are things that Paul says this is sound teaching that the church needs to continually be reminded of. And if you get offended this morning because of two different things I'm going to say, oh, well, I didn't write it, okay? Look at the first one, older men, okay? Everybody gets all worked up about their age, okay? And by the way, we're going to get to the older women, too. Paul must have been pretty bold addressing, okay, you old women. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's literally what it says. Hey, old ladies. <laughs> All right. All right, Paul. All right, here we go. Here's what he says. He says, older men. And so what does he mean here? Well, the, the most Bible commentators agree. So Paul, we know for sure, used this word uh, to describe himself as an older man in the book of Philemon chapter 9. And he was referring this term of himself when he was around the age of 60. And so he's not, when he says older men, he is not referring to the office of elders. He is talking here about an age group, all right? Talking about, about an age group. And it's generally somewhere around the age of 60, okay? So if you as a guy, you, man, you are around the age of 60, you are considered to be an older man, all right? So there you go. If you don't, that should make some of you feel pretty good because you're like, hey, I'm like 58, so I, I'm okay. You're not older yet, but if you're, you get around that 60, that's kind of who he's referring to. And the idea here is this, is that these are some marks of maturity that ought to be in the life of the believer that don't necessarily come with age, but for people who have been saved, this, these marks of maturity in the believer ought to be present, Okay. And so let me, let me encourage us with this. Here, here are some of these things that he challenges. This is healthy teaching. This is what we need to be reminded in our church. He said, older men are to be. So these are not suggestions here. These are not kind of like an option list. This is what God's word says. This ought to be the character qualities of older men in the church. Number one, he says they are to be sober-minded. It literally means sensible right thinking. Sober-mindedness, right thinking, comes from a mind that has been developed and nurtured and shaped by the truth of God's word. Biblical thinking is sober thinking. A sober-minded person is a person whose mind has been um, conformed, changed, transformed by the truth of God's word. Because biblical thinking produces biblical living. 
So if you think biblically, you will live biblically. But if you're thinking unbiblically, then what's going to happen? Well, you're going to live unbiblically. That's just kind of what happens. So he says, you need to be, we need men to be sober. They need to be sober-minded. They need to have sensible, right thinking. They need to be able to be able to view themselves and view life through the lens of Scripture. They're thinking right because they're thinking scripturally. And as they go through life, their life is a mind that is constantly being renewed and being refreshed and confronted and changed and helped by the word of God. So he says they need, there needs to be a, a, a soberness here in the minds of these older men. He also says, look at the next word. He says, and this is kind of interesting. He says, dignified. Now, when the scripture says dignified, he is not simply referring to the way you dress and to your manners. Okay? So some people think, well, if I'm going to be dignified, then that is an aura that I present. And so, you know, I come and I wear a three-piece suit and everything is perfect. And um, I can, I kind of, I lift my nose a little bit in the air. <laughs> and I don't laugh very often. I don't smile. I don't have fun. Uh, and so I walk around and I just kind of look down and I kind of inspect everybody else because that's what dignified people do. Okay, that's not the meaning of the word dignified here. He's really referring to the word dignified here is the idea of a reverence for God and honorable living. So the word, the word, of, of the word here translated dignified simply means he has such a reverence for God that, and his relationship with God is such that it translates into an honorable living. He honors God and he's trying to honor God in his living. And, it's, and he's exemplifying that as he conducts himself as a believer. He's not prone to immature actions and reactions and conduct that come from somebody who's not walking in the spirit, whose mind isn't transformed by truth. He is a person who genuinely knows, walks with, and honors God and conducts himself in a way that his living is honorable before the Lord and before others. The next word is self-controlled. Uh, here, that's, we, we often use the word temperate to um, refer to this, and it refers to the restraints of, in, of indulging selfish desires. So there's to be a, a self-controlled, whether that's self-controlled in their temper, in their physical appetites or temptations, they are able to exercise self-restraint. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 9.27. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Temperance or self-control is also one of the fruits of the Spirit that's listed in Galatians chapter 5. And you find it throughout Scripture that as a child of God, you are going to have to exercise self-restraint. You have, to, you have to, with, to restrain yourself from these sinful desires or these things that maybe that are not sin in and of themselves, but if you continually indulge them, may lead you down a, la a path of carnality or lead your life in a way that's not pleasing to Christ. So, for example, um, as you, most of us, I don't know, I don't know if you have kids like this. Do you have, have you ever had a child who has like no idea of what it means to exercise self restraint when it comes to food, like specifically sweets, like candy? Stuff like that, right? So I have two boys, and they are both very different. Hunter, when he was a kid, he was very, I mean, I love my son, okay? He's not here this morning, so I will say this. Hunter was weird <laughs> when he was little. Because it would be like, here, you know, you'd have all this dessert, and he would have, you know, he'd have brownies and ice cream and cookies, whatever, and he'd be like, he'd eat, and he'd be done. He'd be full, and he'd be like, I'm done. If I was a kid, if it was, specifically if it was sweets, I would eat as much as I could, you know, make myself. And he would just, he'd eat it, and then he'd be like, uh, he'd have a bowl of ice cream or brownies, and he'd be like, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finished, Mom. I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> and then there's Connor. <laughs> Connor's the kid who would go to, uh, we had, I think it was here, they were giving out Oreos or whatever, and apparently whoever was giving them out was being extremely generous because Hunter got the two that he was supposed to get. Connor came back with six. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. We were down in South Carolina, this, or North Carolina, in a small little country church. And the, and the pastor's wife, I mean, these, these, they're, they're pretty deep southern people. And so they're, 
they're scooping out ice cream for us, and she says, say when. You know, say when means to stop dishing the ice cream. That's what say when means, just in case you don't know that. And so they're scooping the ice cream. So Hunter comes back. He gets his two, two scoops. He's fine. He comes back in. And I'll never forget this. I'm, look, I'm looking in the, I'm watching this in the kitchen, and there's Connor. She goes, now, now, Connor, you just say when, okay? When that's enough, you just say when. Connor's sitting there. <laughs> and the bowl was like, it was like this big around, and it was like this deep. I mean, it was a huge bowl. And she just, and she starts giggling. She's laughing because she, she's not saying anything. And he's just grinning. And he's just piling it on and piling it on and finally get the top. And he goes, when? <laughs> Kid has no self-restraint. You see, many times, younger, they don't, they don't, know, how to, they don't know how to have the self-restraint. They, the, they don't have the self-control to say no to uh, eating all the junk food they should. Or sometimes they're just, you know, they'll, they get lazy. If they don't have any self-control, they'll stay in bed all day. Or they'll stay up too late at night, right? And they, don't, they, don't have, they haven't learned the self-control that they need. But our older men ought to be models of self-restraint, of temperance, who have learned by the grace of God and by the Spirit of God and the Word of God to restrain specifically selfish and sinful desires and other areas of their life to help them to live in a way that's pleasing Christ. And that's going to, temperance is something that affects every area of your life, from your tongue and your attitude to your sleep to your food to your spending temperance. Now he's just going to give, I want you to look with me because he, he now gives three things. So there's a list here. He says sound in faith and the, the, the next two, they act, it's actually all one phrase. So it says sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. So these three things actually all go together. So he says they're, they're to be sound or healthy in these three things, in faith, in love and in steadfastness or patience or endurance they go together so here's the idea is that they are rooted and grounded in truth and they're rooted and grounded in when it says faith that's their faith in christ in the body of doctrine about christ in the word or the word of god they're sound in faith what they believe to be true about god and his word they're rooted and grounded in it they're also rooted and grounded in what love is in charity they are also a grounded in endurance or steadfastness. The word steadfastness is the idea of endurance during difficult times or trials. In other words, they're not easily shaken. They don't easily quit. They don't give in. They don't give up. They stay even in, in times where there are trials or an opposition. They stand fast in difficult times. And so he says... These aged men need to be very, um, they need to be healthy in faith, love, and steadfastness. Why is that important? Well, for numbers of reasons. So I want to I walk through these three things. Number one, they need to be healthy, they need to be sound in the faith. What they believe about Christ, what they believe about the gospel, what they believe about his word, because these men are to be modeling and living out and communicating and through their testimony of their life, but even with their lips, they ought to be able, they ought to be so grounded in it and so healthy in it that their lives are affecting the other people in the church and they are a godly example of leadership in the church. Men, there is a burden on us to be men of the word, to know the word, to be healthy in the faith to be rooted and grounded in the truth. Not only are we rooted and grounded in that truth and in that teaching of the word, we're to be rooted and grounded in love. And this is something I think that we have lost in, to a degree in our culture. I'm not saying it's simply a cultural problem, but I believe it's something we are certainly have lost in our churches, is that we have lost, for some reason, it's the women who are to be loving. Where's that scripture? Why is it just the women who are to be loving? The exhortation is the men. We are to be healthy, rooted, grounded in what it means to agape, to have love. And that's going to be loving our wives. It's going to be loving our God. That's going to be loving other believers. It's going to be loving the lost. 
we need to be modeling biblical love. And the reality is, is I think part, I think there's a number of reasons for it, but I think one of the reasons is, is that love has become, this word love so, so often is only used in a, in a romantic sense, that it's really lost the weight and the value of the biblical sense of agape love, which is a sacrifice, a sacrificial serving love that always seeks the good and better of another without expecting anything in return. And it's a love that's rooted in the person and work of Christ. And it's, it's his love for us and the agape love of God that's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Ghost that's been given to us and then flows out of our lives in the way that we live. But it's, it should not be uncommon for the el- older men in our church to verbally communicate love to others in the congregation. And it should not be odd or unusual for the men in our church, elder men in our church, to be communicating not only verbally, but with their actions and their attitudes, genuine agape love towards others, towards other men in the church and toward other believers in the church, regardless of whether they're ladies or teens or children. We ought to be living examples of love. Men, this is one of the things that I think we need to really we need to really get up to the plate on, get to bat on, and start really working on, go to 1 Corinthians 13, look what agape love is and does and what it's not. And we need to be modeling that in our churches. Then he says this, not only love, but he says in, in steadfastness. This is endurance in trials and difficulties. As you go through life, just by the na- the longer you live, it seems, the more trials you go through, Right? And what's interesting here is he says we're, there's to be, you're to be healthy as a pattern of endurance as you go through difficulty and trials in life. Men, your family and other families and other people and even the church are going to go through trials. And we need men who are rooted in the truth, who are able to not only withstand, but to stand and to encourage others to stand and to help bring steadfastness in the body as we point others to Christ because we have walked with God through trials ourselves and seen him faithful. And now we are going to help others who are going through that. We are going to be, we shouldn't see men who are falling apart and don't know where to turn. We ought to see men who steadfastly face the trials and difficulties of life through the word of God, steadfastly enduring. And this is what he says. He says, you are to be healthy. You are to be rooted and grounded in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Then, now this is where he goes where angels don't dare to trade. He goes to the older women, all right? <laughs> That's verse number three. He said, older women, now this is, again, those who are probably around the, around the age of 60 or so or older, so if that's you, don't get mad at me and don't say, oh, Pastor Brent was in there calling us a bunch of old ladies today. Okay, you can take that up with Paul when you get to heaven, all right? That's what he said. So, but that's the idea. So he's now referring to ladies that are probably around that age of 60. Here's the idea, is that these are, are ladies who, don't, who are um, around the age of 60. They don't have child, if they're married, they don't have child rearing uh, responsibilities anymore. The children are growing and out of the home. That's, that's kind of the idea of this of the way this word was used in the, in the culture and in the Greek language, this, that's kind of the idea of the wording. So somewhere around that 60-ish age, uh, children were grown were out of the house if they, were, if they were married and had children. And then they said this. He says, so, so here's some exhortation to the, to the older women. Older women, likewise, are in this way, are also to be... Here's a list of, their, of some exhortations that he gives. He goes, they're to be reverent in behavior... That's their demeanor, their deportment, the way they, they, they carry themselves. They are to be reverent in behavior. It kind of gives the same idea as the idea of the dignified a little bit. It's the idea of a reverent honor for the Lord in their walk with Christ. But they're also, it's in the, it's in the way they carry themselves that they are walking in a way that is a, um, their deportment and behavior is a, a, holy, godly living. 
and they're seeking to honor Christ. Their, their life is a reflection, their living is a reflection of their relationship with Christ. Okay? So that's what he's saying here. And they reflect this, this reverent behavior. Here's the idea. It's a little kind of hard necessarily from the, from the Greek to the English. But what he's saying here, the, the, the things that follow after is, this is the way that they are reverent in their behavior. So they're to be reverent in their behavior, and this is how they do it. So what he's about to list out are ways that elder women are to be um, reverent in their behavior. So not slanderers, that's the first thing. They're not to be slanderers. That's the idea of not a false accuser or spreading gossip. They need to be careful with their tongues. Ladies, you need to be careful with your tongues. You need to be careful not to be spreading gossip. You shouldn't be slandering. You shouldn't be exaggerating. You shouldn't be using your tongues to attack people. You shouldn't be, your, you shouldn't be using your tongues to share all the things that you like or don't like, specifically things you don't like, and to be a cause of dissension. Don't be a slanderer. Don't use your tongue in a way that's not pleasing to Christ. He is not only to be a slanderer, he said they're not to be slaves to much wine. The idea here is, is that they're not to be enslaved to alcohol. Alcohol can become a controlling influence in a person's life. They're not to be enslaved or under the influence of alcohol. Then he says, they are, so here's the, the older women are, here's what they're supposed to be doing, they are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So we're going to walk through that. He says they're, they're need, they need to be, um, as a godly lady, they are to teach what is good. Now here's the problem when we get to the teaching part, is a lot of ladies panic on that. because like, oh no, I don't want to be a teacher, because they think of teaching happening only in the classroom. Okay, this is not, this is not talking about formal classroom instruction okay so you can just kind of like <sighs> take that burden off of you. you you don't have to do it in a formal classroom setting but you do have an obligation to be communicating truth that's the idea what the teaching is you are to be communicating truth to and he gives it specifically here to the younger woman in the church there are specific things that god wants you to teach others. And what are they? Well, here's what he says. He says they're to, they're to teach the young ladies, the young women, what is good. The idea here is that is, is what is of value, that which is of benefit, that which is help. It kind of goes back in line with sound doctrine. It's good, healthy teaching. It's that which is Christ-honoring and that which is beneficial to them. So here's some of those things that they are to teach what is good and so train or help the young women to love their husbands and children, to have affection for their husband. Well, it's here's here this is very interesting because you have to remember when this was written, many, if not most, marriages were arranged. And so it was very common for basically people who were kind of strangers to get married and that really wasn't her choice to marry that guy and maybe she didn't really you know, I'm, I had to marry this guy and you know, my parents arranged this marriage and here we go there were people in the church that were in that situation and he says you need to train you need to help these young ladies to know what it means to love their husbands, to have an affection for their husbands, to care, to give, to sacrifice of yourself, that agape love that is kind, that is gentle, that isn't rude, that doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. All the things in 1 Corinthians 13, to, to, to have that kind of sacrificial love for their husbands. By the way, let's just let's be honest, marriage can be challenging. Marriage can be, marriage can, can be many times difficult. And ladies, you that fit in this category of the older women, you can be used of God to be a constant and consistent encouragement to younger ladies in loving their husbands and in how to love their children. Because that's what the text says, the young women to love their husbands and children. That seems kind of odd that, you know, you'd say, don't 
most ladies just naturally love their kids. I mean, you kind of love, right? I mean, naturally love your kids. But it's, it's, not just, it's not just that you actually love them, but it's how to love them. Because sometimes it's very easy for lady, for doesn't, ladies and men, we as parents, it's very easy to, because we, we think we're being loving by giving kids whatever they want, or we're not being an authority as we ought to be. Or sometimes we're, we're, we, we err, we get, we get too hard on the side of strictness and harshness, right? And so there's different balances, and sometimes a, an older lady can, can come in and can, and can help a lady say, listen, here are some things, here's some suggestions, ways to help you to, to, to love your children in a way that's honoring to Christ, how to love your husband. We've we got to continue. He says this not only to, he says also to be self-controlled. That's the same word that's been um, used before, to, uh, to be temperate, to discipline themselves in their thinking, to have, to, um, have self-control in their desires and to guard themselves. He says the word, the word pure here refers to moral purity, guarding their moral purity, not being unfaithful in their minds or bodies, in their marriage, not committing adultery, guarding that, being very careful. And then he says this, not only to be pure, but he says here, um, he says working at home, keepers at home is how another translation has it, working at home. And this is where a lot of people get really upset here because they say, are you saying that women can't work outside the home. That is not what the text is saying, that a lady cannot, that's not, not what it means. But the idea here is that it is the idea of taking care of the home, managing the home, cares for the condition of her home, and that it will be well set, well put for her family, and is creating a clean, orderly environment that is conducive to unity and comfort in the home. That's what, it, that's what it means. So the idea of managing or, and making sure the home is a clean and orderly place of peace and well run. That's really the idea of what it means to be a keeper at home. Now, I will say this. This is not valued by a lot of ladies today. A lot of ladies don't value the keeping at home. And I'm sorry to hear that. That's, that's, that is... Because we have a society that is so anti-God and anti-scriptural, they automatically want to contradict anything that God's word says. So listen, this is not saying that men, that we don't help clean, that we don't help clean the house or do dishes or cook or those kind of things. That's not what it's teaching. You need to understand that. It's not saying that everything that's only, you probably heard this, that's women's work. Did you ever hear that? That's women's work. I don't do that. In our house, there was no such thing. No, I cleaned toilets as a kid. I vacuumed. I dusted. I made beds. I washed sinks and mirrors. I did all that. Okay. Dad said, all of us, we're going we're gonna to all, we're going to know how to take care of the house on the inside and outside. We're going to all share together. But you know the one, the one who made hot home work, who kept everything organized and clean. And there, you know there's a difference between kid clean and mom clean. You know that? You ever notice that? That's what we should tell our boys. They go clean. Boys go clean your room. They go up there. Okay, it's clean. And we'd ask them this. Is it mom clean? <sighs> a, a home that is clean and orderly and well kept. And you know what? That is a, this is a high responsibility. And you know what? They're just, some ladies are naturally good at it. You know what? Some of you elderly ladies, you could actually really help some younger ladies to be able to know how to manage, maybe manage their time, manage things better, how to do things, how to structure things for a family. It's so maybe a lady, maybe she's not naturally gifted in that kind of administration. You can really help give them practical insight into how to keep their home. We got to keep going here. He says they're not only to be keepers at home, but the, the word also says they're to be kind and submissive to their own husbands. To be in sub the word kind here is that you're being good, and it's primarily to their family, but also guests. The idea is that it's a warm home of kindness. Our homes are not to be battle zones, okay? They're to be, they're to be homes of kindness. And then it says, obedient to their own husbands, or subject, or submissive to their own husbands. They place themselves uh, under their husband's God given authority because they're doing it. It's like Colossians chapter 3 tells us, wives, submit yourselves unto your own, own husbands as unto the Lord, because your submissiveness to your husband is a reflection of your submissiveness to, to God's authority. You submit yourself to your husband's authority 
because that's what God has said. And by submitting yourself to his authority, you're submitting yourself to God's. Doesn't mean you don't have a voice or an opinion or a say. It's not what it's saying at all. Doesn't mean you're second class or second rate. It means that God has placed the weight and accountability of leadership on the husband and that you as a wife have a responsibility to submit to your husband and live in, and help your home to function according to God's design. Finally, he says this, he says at the end, he says, the word of God may not be reviled or so that the word of God would not be slandered and mocked by the unsaved. All of this is done because these things are all testimonies to the lost around us. He goes, the reason you're supposed to do these things is so that the word of God is not slandered and mocked. So I know, I know there's people moving back there, but okay, they got out early. I'm not late, just so you understand that, okay? Yeah, Pastor Ben's got to go preach somewhere this morning, so, so hang tight just for a couple minutes, all right? Um, it's important how we conduct ourselves as Christians because how we conduct ourselves as Christians is a reflection of our relationship with Christ, and that is a testimony to the lost around us. And when Christians don't function, we're not obedient, and we're not living according to God's word, that causes the word of God to be mocked to be slandered, to be reviled. Now, I was really hoping to have more time. It's my fault we didn't. I spent a little more time than I expected on explaining some of those things. But I want to quickly lay out a couple things. And if we have time for a question or two, it'd be awesome. But I want you to think about this. How are we doing as a church in life on life, mentoring, discipling, encouraging, the life of older men touching and connecting with the life of younger men, mentoring and helping them, and the lives of our older women connecting and mentoring the lives of our younger women. And what are things we can do to live out this passage of scripture? Now, I understand that the beginning of the chapter, it didn't, it didn't say, the first part, it didn't give an exhortation for the older men to teach the younger men like it said, in the passage, older women train the younger women. I understand it wasn't said. It may be implied, but for sure, the pattern of discipleship is life on life. And I really believe that it's good for the older men in our church to be able to input into the lives of the younger. So, those are, is there things we can do? Any thoughts, any questions? I know it's a little short on time, but I want you to think about that. How are we doing on that? And what could we do practically that would help us to live out this truth in the context of Community Baptist Church. Any thoughts? I want to say this, and if you, have a, if you have a thought, you can raise your hand, okay? I want you to think, I think this, is that there have been too often in our churches, there's been a culture of generational divides where one generation doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to connect and to impact another generation. And all churches, since the very first ones, have been intergenerational, okay? So let's stop using generations as excuses for that, all right? They all have, okay? They're all made up of people from, who were born in different time eras. I want to encourage you to do this, and, and hopefully next Sunday, and think about this next Sunday, we'll come back to it. I'd really like you to think about this, because I think we, this is something we need to be more intentional with in our church, and that we could do better in our church, and that is life on life. How can we connect generations of people, older women with younger women, older men with younger men, life on life, impacting truth upon life to be an encouragement and a help to one another to live out our faith? And what are you willing to do? Those of you who are in the older category, are you willing to make yourself available and say, I am willing I volunteer. I am willing to do that. How about some of you younger ones? Are you willing to say, you know what? Yeah, I would love to connect. I would love to be connected with an older couple, an older person, an older lady, an older man, individual or a couple. I would love to connect my life with someone so that they can input into my life and that we can be a joint encouragement to one another in living out our faith. Think about those things. We'll come back next Sunday and uh, we'll continue in our text. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the instruction your word has given to us. May we heed it and obey it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.